welcome each and every one of you. We have a good grouping of Athenaeum members and also a whole bunch of you who are coming from elsewhere. And I want to welcome you to our first virtual uh, literary award lecture. Our hope is that next year we'll be, be able again to do it in, um, in our space live there, but hopefully we'll be able to live stream you all from everywhere else in at the same time. I'm Beth Hessel, the executive director of this historic and vibrant Philadelphia institution. And whether you are a decades long shareholder, a new member, or a guest, we hope that you will feel welcomed into our community as a vital part of our tradition of intellectual curiosity and deep passion for the history and welfare of our city, our country, and our world, and a belief that engagement with history and literature, the sciences, art, and architecture, and with one another in honest dialogue are all vital to creating a vibrant and healthy society. If this sounds like the perfect home for you, no matter where you're coming from, I hope you'll consider becoming a member as we grow our community and our conversations. Now tonight's a special night. Since 1950, the Athenaeum of Philadelphia has participated in the literary war world with our literary awards. These awards recognize and encourage literary achievement among authors who are quote, bona fide residents living within a 30 mile radius of Philadelphia's City Hall at the time their book was written or published. The award committee reviews books on the basis of their significance and importance to the general public, as well as for their literary excellence. Sometimes they don't find any books that meet the criteria and they pass on giving awards, but this year um, we were really thrilled with one book that especially stood out above all others. So this year, the Literary Award for Art and Architecture Community found that this one book stood out as a gem among the contenders. Batold Rubczynski, whose readable and intimate style introduces readers to important themes in architecture and preservation, previously won this award in 1999 for his book, A Clearing in the Distance, and in 1995 for City Life. So as he said to us earlier, he's written, oh, I just disappeared. He has written 20 books. So three of them have won the literary award from the Athenaeum of Philadelphia. The committee chaired by Dr. Satoko Parker had strong praises for this year's winner, Charleston Fancy, Little Houses and Big Dreams in the Holy City. Committee members recommended Charleston Fancy as a quote, meditation on architecture, urbanity, community, friendship, restraint, idiosyncrasy and smallness and called it an extremely readable as well as an important book about living gracefully and well with an awareness of both limits and community. Another comment from the committee was, Witold Rachimsky's book, Charleston Fancy, illustrates how a vision for the development of architectural projects in a unique city are enhanced by the fact that the architects and other players live and participate in the life of that community. Rybczynski is, ex is excellent in connecting larger architectural and community planning ideas to the local situation. He shows how the people there get the job done. A native of Edinburgh, trained in architecture at McGill University and a former professor there, an emeritus professor of urbanism at the University of Pennsylvania, Professor Rybczynski brings his years of practice and teaching, of experimenting and listening to his work. What he reveals in Charleston Fancy is that he considers himself, like his reader, a deeply curious lifelong learner with a deep empathy for his human and his built subjects. We are honored tonight to enjoy Professor Rybczynski's Literary Award lecture and look forward to being able to present his award in person and to fet him once we are past this pandemic. Before we welcome Dr. Rybczynski to the virtual podium, I want to do a little bit of housekeeping and that's to let you know that you are welcome to put in either the Q&A or chat any questions you might have at any time during the lecture. I will be going through and keeping track of them and after uh, Vitold finishes his talk, uh, I will moderate those questions for a time of Q&A. But at this time, I hope you will join me in warmly welcoming uh, Vitold Rymczynski to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia to celebrate his literary award. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Uh, and thank you to the Athenaeum for honoring Charleston Fancy. It's, it's much appreciated, particularly when it comes from what has become my hometown. We've been here more than 20 years, 20 something years. Uh, 
I feel a bit strange, I must confess, giving this talk. I feel like a stage actor who suddenly dropped into a movie set and all I see is a camera. I'm used to talking to faces. Uh, even bored students are worth something to when you see them. So I'm gonna, I'll do my best. Uh, Charleston Fancy, let me start with the uh, subtitle to this book. It's Little Houses and Big Dreams in the Holy City. It describes the three themes of this book. Little Houses, it's a book about architecture. Uh, the Big Dreams, it's also a book about real estate development, which is the way we build our cities. Uh, Charleston, was a real estate speculative project right from the beginning. It was built by what we would call venture capitalists. Uh, they got the land from the King, uh, King Charles. Uh, so just in case they named it Charlestown, just to, just to show good faith to him. Uh, so real estate development is one of the themes and the, the Holy City is the nickname of Charleston. It's a city with many churches and particularly uh, in the 18th century, the, the, it was a city that when you arrived by ship, you saw steeples, many church steeples. It was, it was a very tolerant city, other than Roman Catholics who were not tolerated at the beginning. It had a, one of the first synagogues in the new colonies, and it had uh, Huguenot churches as well as Anglican churches. Uh, so it's three themes. I've written books about all these subjects separately, but Charleston Fancy weaves the themes together. So it's a complicated, <clears throat> it's a complicated book because it's, it's a story, uh, a story of young builders in Charleston. And it's also the story of the city. I'm, tonight I'm gonna talk for about 40 minutes or so about a particular project that they did. Uh, the book ranges much further afield because it talks about the history of Charleston. It talks about many projects which, which these architects have done. I, in the course of my research, I came across a, a wonderful book by a local historian published in 1945 by Beatrice St. Julian Ravenel, who was a Charlestonian who was very interested in architectural history. She wasn't an architect, she was really a, an artist and a watercolorist. But she wrote a book called The Architects of Charleston, and this was a dis her description of these. These were mainly the 18th century people who had built the Charleston, which is the sort of beautiful city that even in 1945, people admired a great deal. And she writes, the majority of them were hardworking and conscientious men, and the best were decidedly gifted. As a rule, they were young, and something of the force of youth went into their buildings. I said this was a story, and the, the um, oops, I'm not, the title of my talk is Locotecture in the City. It, it's not a real word, it's something I made up, uh, but it means architecture which is designed and built by people who live in the city. Uh, our ancestors would have been puzzled by this because all the buildings, in a city like Philadelphia, where I am, were built by Philadelphians. It was taken for granted. The people knew the architects, the architects knew the people, and they built beautiful buildings, which is what makes Philadelphia so special. Uh, we're now used to bringing in architects from, from other countries as well as other cities, and it's all very exciting, but we've lost that sense of localness. The architects don't necessarily know the city, they certainly don't live in the city, and you get a very different sort of architecture. But this, So this is a story of local architecture. All these people were attracted by Charleston. Uh, only one of them has roots in Charleston, very deep roots, going back several generations. The others were, were people from New York or uh, from the Midwest, from from the south, from uh, Georgia, uh, who were attracted to the city and made it their home and brought their own special talents to the city. So it's, a, it's an odd group of people. There's some developers, there's a self-taught architect and a builder, there's a young architect who's a, actually a 
University of Pennsylvania graduate. Uh, there's an Air Force pilot who reti who's retired now and who is partners with one of the builders. So it's a it's an, a group of characters and it's a true story, but it's really, for me, it was like a novel because as, and I will give you sort of one chapter of this book. Uh, if you don't know Charleston, Charleston sits at the meeting of two rivers, the Cooper and the Ashley. Uh, and it's in that peninsula where it says Charleston at the bottom of the peninsula is where the city started growing and it grew northward. Uh, it's a bit like Manhattan, which is on a long, narrow island, except it's a peninsula, so it could keep going. And North Charleston is much more of a suburban sprawl that you see around many American cities. And, and then if you, if you go further up to the top of that map, you get the airport. There was a Navy yard which built ships in the Second World War. Uh, Boeing has a huge factory there now. So. Uh, all this area is urbanized. Mount Pleasant is a small separate city across from Charleston, the Charleston Bay. But those squares on the map are all these projects that I discuss in the book. Uh, but we're going to look at one particular one, uh, which is Cat Fiddle, which is on, not in the oldest part of Charleston, but partly, partly up the peninsula. Uh, towards the north, which is now all built up. So the story starts with uh, Jerry Moran, the Air Force pilot, uh, who buys this house. This is an old house. They, it was called a sharecropper's cottage. These were houses built right after the Civil War, uh, either by, sorry, it was a freedman's cottage. I mixed that up. It was a they were built by either freedmen, black ex-slaves who were now free, or simply by less, uh, less affluent white people. So they're very small houses. They're one room wide, long and narrow. Uh, this got a porch added to it. Uh, so this was an old house, probably built in the, I forget, the 1880s, something like that. Uh, you know, much renovated and changed over the years. What really interested Jerry, however, was the fact that uh, it sat on a very big lot. Uh, Charleston, when it was laid out in colonial times, had very large blocks. So the typical city has 100 foot deep lots. Charleston has 200 foot deep lots. So they're very large, there's lots of room in the back and the city encourages people to build additional units in the back to densify the city. And that's what really attracted uh, Jerry to the lot, is that he wanted uh, to develop, he had done projects which I won't go into, but which are discussed in the book. They, he and his partner, George, had done projects uh, where they had filled up this, these back areas. And so they had some experience in that. Uh, the first thing to do was to renovate the front building so that they could rent it out uh, and and start paying for the cost of buying the land. Uh, and you can see they basically had to strip off the exterior materials so that the, the wood was all rotten on the outside. But when they took off the old sheetrock on the inside, they discovered that the interior uh, was all beautiful pine and they decided to leave it, they cleaned it and varnished it. And so this is not, it looks like a construction site photo, but this is the finished photo, not furnished yet. Uh, and they, they decided to leave all the coats of paint. It had been painted sort of literally scores of times over the more than 100 years since it had been built. And they, so you get this beautiful collage of, of, of these different colors. And then, of course, it gets more modern things like the kitchen, but on the right-hand side, you can see some of the old wood incorporated into that. Once the front house was finished, they, they turned their attention to what they would build in the back. And the first building they built, which you can see there, was a very small three-story building. Uh, most of the buildings I'll show you were, are built out of cement block. Uh, it's a very humid climate. Uh, they also have 
famously hurricane. So, so reinforced concrete and cement are a good idea, but they decided to try a wooden house. And this is, if you live in Philadelphia, you would call this a Trinity house because it's very similar. It's one room on each floor, a very small, I think it was 14 by 20 or 14 by 18, a very small house with a kitchen sort of kitchen living room on the ground floor, one bedroom and a bathroom, and then another bedroom on the, on the very top. Unlike at Trinity, it's not a row house, however, so it has lots of windows, lots of light inside, uh, and it, they reuse some of the wood from the uh, Friedman's cottage in the construction, but made a very nice sort of paneling. Their theory or I guess theory is maybe too grand a name, but their idea for developing houses is to build very small houses, but then to put the money into the quality of the house. So rather than just providing tons of space, which is just a lot of sheetrock, they, they put a lot of effort into creating character, architectural character, even though the house is extremely small. This house was about 700 square feet, I think. Uh, this looking at the other end of that front room with the kitchen and uh, again not a not a conventional kitchen with cabinets everywhere but sort of some recessed open shelving uh, also things like refrigerated drawers and so there's a lot of kind of modern high-tech stuff here uh, as well as a very traditional approach to architecture uh, I don't know if if you can see the house on the right, this the picture is blocked, I think, with the with the photograph with our faces. But there, the second house they built was built by Andrew Gould, who is the Penn graduate that I mentioned. He was a partner of George and uh, worked on the first house, and he and George designed the, the house I just showed you, uh, and. It, Andrew and his wife uh, had a growing family and they, they were renting a, a smallish house in, in town, but uh, they decided that he would build a house uh, that would accommodate them. And they built this beautiful little four-story house. It's got a living room and kitchen, dining area on the ground floor, then the bedroom on the next floor, the kids' rooms, sort of a nursery and bedroom on the top floor. And the ground floor was Andrew's workshop, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute. This is based on, it sort of feels Dutch, and some the, the oldest house, surviving house in Charleston was a model for this house. It has a gambrel roof, and it has uh, kind of the same feeling of, of this house. It, uh, you'll see all the houses here are very different in style. Some of the styles are based on local examples. Some of the styles are much more uh, imaginary or come from completely different places. So it's, it's an interesting case where houses in an old city don't necessarily follow a very narrow style. They're not all, they're not all colonial, for example. Here's a view of the inside. It's got a very pronounced post beam structure, this big, huge, chunky beam in th that runs down the center and, and uh, wooden beams. Uh, Andrew is a very skilled craftsman, and so he was uh, able to build all these uh, built in uh, shelves and various details. A bedroom upstairs with the wood paneling, and then in. Uh, in addition to designing houses with George, Andrew also has a business creating ecclesiastical accessories, I guess you would call them, lecterns, pulpits. Uh, his, his assistant is working on a big chandelier for a Byzantine uh, Orthodox church that Andrew and George designed in Mount Pleasant. Uh, Jerry knew that it was much easier to, to plan these developments if you have more space. Uh, the city encourages the construction of, of houses in these back areas, but it's very strict about, uh, for instance, you have to have two parking spaces per house. 
So you can make very small houses, but you still are stuck with two rather large cars. Two cars is about a bigger footprint than some of these houses. So that if you have more land, you have more flexibility in trying to plan things like parking. So he approached the, the, the neighbor to the north, that, that square that you see there, and asked him if he wanted to join in and sort of combine their two lots, which would give them more flexibility. And then the neighbor wasn't keen. He was an absentee landlord. He wasn't very keen to do that, but he said, I'll sell you the back of my lot. And, and that's what the top yellow square is. Uh, so that enlarged uh, Jerry's lot by you know, a significant amount. There was also a piece of land at the bottom, what, what, what is sometimes called a landlocked lot. It's not on a street, it's, it's in the back. And at this point, the, the, a new person joins this group, a new character in a sense enters the story. Reed Burgess was a bluegrass mandolin player uh, from Brooklyn uh, who had kind of, he had, they had a very successful best-selling record when, when the group started, but as, as happens in music, the group sort of at one point drifted apart and uh, Jerry was looking for, I'm sorry, Reed was looking for new opportunities. He ended up meeting George, uh, actually thanks to an article that I wrote about George's Palladian house. Reed was a, was a great admirer of Palladio, the Renaissance architect, and so he was interested to meet George, and in any case, to make this story much shorter than it was in, in reality, he ended up moving to Charleston, meeting George, and deciding he wanted to build himself a house. And he made an offer to the owner of that little yellow piece of land in the bottom corner, and the, it was all going ahead, was going fine, and then the city stepped in and said, it's really too small a lot, we can't give you a building permit for this lot. Uh, this is the house that uh, Reed was using as a model. It's a house in Charleston designed by Robert Mills, uh, a very famous architect because he's the architect of the Washington Monument and other buildings in Washington, D.C. But he worked, lived and worked in Charleston for a number of years, and he built a church. And this is not the church, it's, it's the parish house of the church. And Reed imagined building a little house which would, would be would have this columned porch and and the staircase and kind of version of this uh, which would would have worked on that little lot but he was disappointed and so Jerry said why don't I I'll sell you a piece of my land uh, and you can build there instead and that's how this house came about it's on it's occupies about a third of that piece that Jerry had bought from the neighbor. You couldn't build what, you couldn't build a freestanding house. This had to be a row house because these three houses were very tight. And so uh, Jerry and George were in New York for an exhibition of Palladio's drawings and houses, and they were really struck by the Villa Saraceno, which is one of the smallest houses, an early house of Palladio and one of the smallest ones. It's only got uh, basically three bedrooms and a, a large room in the center. Uh, that was, of course, still much too big. And what, what Reed did, which was very smart, is it he just took the center part, the portico, and the the portico of the house is about the size of his lot. So you can see the difference in scale. And, and then he ended up with this, which is really the portico of the Villa Saraceno turned into a house. A, a, it's got a kind of a studio apartment in effect at the bottom, very tall ceiling, and then two rooms at the top. George convinced Reed that he needed to add two rooms so that he could rent them out. Uh, Charleston has a lot of students. The College of Charleston is about 12,000. And so there's always a market for renting single rooms, just one room with a bathroom. And, uh, and, and then that will help pay for the house. Reed was not independently wealthy by any means. It's, it's a tiny 
Palladian house, but it's very Palladian. It's got this extremely tall ceiling. It's about a 16 or 18 foot ceiling. Uh, it has the exposed beams at the top holding it up. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of really a studio apartment. The, the open doors on the far side uh, enclose a little kitchenette. So you open up the doors and there's your bar kitchen. And then there's a little uh, bathroom with a shower under the stairs. And uh, the two rooms above meant that you could rent this to three people or you could make this into a, you could rent the, the upper rooms and the lower rooms together. Uh, this, I wanted to show this because one of the things that gives a lot of Palladian feeling to this house is that it really has these thick masonry walls, which is what Pallad Palladio's buildings are generally brick with plastered brick. Uh, but it makes a huge difference when you have eight, these, block, these walls are eight inch blocks or sometimes double eight inch blocks, which makes them 16 inches thick. And so that becomes a very important part of the architecture because they feel solid. And you can see here, they're building these arched openings with, with real arches made out of bricks. Uh, Andrew made some beautiful details They when they, excavated the foundations, they found all these old bricks buried underneath and they recycled the bricks and made these kind of dentals using these old bricks. So you get, it's, it's like the memory of a classical Palladian house. It's not a archeological reconstruction, but it, it has the overall shape of that loggia, but it, and, and it kind of reminds you of what uh, classical architecture had been in the Renaissance. Uh, at the same time, they built a, th a second house in that area, and this was a house for Jerry's sister, uh, who had been living in Ireland and who had come back to uh, Charleston. She was ill, and so the house, I won't go into all those details, but the house is designed for somebody uh, who's, who's going to have a long uh, illness and there are all sorts of features that primarily George had worked out by studying uh, elderly people and, and visiting places where people with incapacities were living. Very different from Reed's house. It's a kind of, it feels a little bit Dutch with that, that stepped gable or maybe Jacobean. Uh, you, they uh, they had to accommodate a car under the house. There was no other way. There was they were running out of space for, as I said, it had every house has to have two cars, even though the houses are small. So there, that's that's a a space with, for a car. In fact, Mary, who lived here, didn't have a car, so she in effect uses as a kind of porch a place to sit out if it was raining, and that piece sticking out is actually her kitchen. Uh, those are not act openable windows, but it looks like a, a sort of Oriel from a Jacobean house with, with solid, uh, sort of permanently closed shutters. There's a little apartment on the ground floor uh, and then a two-story room on the second floor and a, and a sleeping loft, which was intended for uh, a, 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 care, a caregiver if that would be required in the future. Uh, these were wooden columns that George had salvaged from some old building site. Uh, a lot of these buildings gain character because they reuse bits and pieces of older buildings, which is obviously partly done for economic reasons, a lot cheaper, and partly done uh, to create this, these, you could get these columns made, but some of the things that they use you know, the character of old bricks is just a very beautiful thing. And it, it introduces a whole different aspect to, to an interior. Uh, in 2011, so we're about six years in now, uh, the owners of the property next door on the south uh, approached Jerry and asked him if he was uh, interested in buying. They were an elderly black couple. They, they wanted to move to North Philadelphia and live with their, I think with their son. Uh, and they were living in a very old house. They couldn't afford to 
keep it up properly, as we'll see. Uh, but they were interested in selling and they finally came to an arrangement. And so now Jerry had added a considerable, you know, 50% to, he had about a third of an acre. Uh, a third of an acre in the suburbs is a very small lot. A third of an acre in the middle or close to the middle of Charleston is actually a lot of land. And as we'll see, a, a lot, you can have a lot of people living on it. Uh, this was a very old house. It had been a bar and restaurant on the ground floor, which had since closed. So the ground floor was basically empty when, the, when at this point. And the, and, uh, the upstairs was in pretty bad shape. So only part of the house was actually lived in, the back part. And there were some additions at the back that were in really terrible shape. Uh, so what, of course, what really attracted uh, Jerry was the fact that he was able to build a couple of houses behind this. Uh, and, and then, so it, they decided to leave the house, kind of stabilize it, uh, put some props around on the interior. Uh, but really they, they, they were interested in developing the rear. Uh, at this point, the story changed again because Andrew's parents from Massachusetts, uh, outside Boston, uh, had decided to retire to Charleston to be with their grandchildren, as, as so often happens. And uh, they, they offered Jerry that they would buy the back of the lot. They would buy both the whole thing. Uh, they would build their house and they would still have room for a second house, which, which they could build a second house, which would help to pay for their own house. So what you see there is the cottage that Andrew designed for them. It was it was quite unusual because it is a cottage rather than a sort of Charleston type house. And it's built using uh, post and beam for parts of the house like the porches here. Uh, and also as we'll see the interior. Uh, Andrew taught at the American College of the Building Arts, which is a unique Charleston college, which gives bachelor degrees in things like carpentry and stone carving and iron work. So it's a, it's a kind of accredited university or college, but focusing on the building arts. And one of their teachers was taught heavy wood framing. And, and so he and students helped Andrew with that part of this project. You can see here's the interior. The, it's a one essentially a big open space and that's where the post and beam framing makes a lot of sense. The upstairs bedrooms are built more conventionally because you don't really need posts and beams for small rooms. Again, very it's kind of arts and crafts, English arts and crafts on the inside. Uh, here's the other end of the room and that staircase becomes a sort of feature of going up through the center. The upstairs, basically the, the parents' bedroom and a small guest room. The, the, they then turned their attention to the front house. It's called the blue chip. They, they found a, an old Coca-Cola sign which must have been hanging outside for the, for the blue chip. And then Reed told me that when he talked to some of the older neighbors, he discovered that they, they still remember that that was in fact the name of the, of the restaurant or the bar. Uh, the, but it was in terrible shape. And, and when, the, when the parents moved into the house, they, they, they had the, the view towards the back of this really decrepit uh, building and so they weren't they were keen that somebody should take this up and uh, Jerry th thought that Reed should take this on Reed was the remember he built that little Palladian house but he had moved to, to Charleston and he was interested in in building more and, and in be learning about development and Jerry thought if restoring a house is very different than building a new house and that he ought to have that experience and so he he sold him the house and uh, Andrew's parents gave him a second mortgage, which allowed him to do the actual construction work, which as you'll see, was considerable. 
when they started looking at the house, that one of the things about fixing up old houses is that until you start taking things apart, you don't really know what's there or what isn't there. And you generally, the, the seller will not allow you to, to rip walls apart before you buy it. So what they discovered was that the whole, the foundations were in terrible shape. It was a very old house. They didn't pay much attention to foundations in, in the, you know, when this was built probably more than a hundred years ago. Uh, the, the foundation was in terrible shape, the, and the walls were, were not in great shape. And so they had to jack up the building, as you'll see here, and build new foundation and then lower the house onto those foundations and restore, uh, and then essentially build a brand new first floor. And there's the finished house which is really turned into what in Charleston is called a single house. A single house is a long, narrow house with verandas on the side on two floors, which is what this has. Uh, and this was planned by George and Reed in, and turned into a three apartment building. So there's a large apartment on the second floor and two small apartments on the ground floor. And here's a, a view of one of those verandas. Uh, it was a, it's a very interesting house type that grew up in Charleston and is unique to Charleston. No other places in South Carolina even have these single houses. Uh, and yet the single house has, which started, some people think it may have come from the Caribbean. A lot of people came to Charleston from Barbados. Uh, although there are no single houses in Barbados, so who knows. Uh, but the single houses have been built all the way up to the present day. People still build single houses. The, the colonial single houses are, tend to be Georgian. The modern single houses might be quite contemporary looking with vinyl siding. But uh, the idea of a long narrow house with, with cross ventilated rooms and big porches that you can sit out on uh, is very attractive in a hot, humid climate. By then, George's parents, I'm sorry, Andrew's parents, who had built that, live in that little cottage, uh, they had, they realized that they really didn't want to get into the whole bother of building a second house. And besides which they had planted and got used to having a very nice garden in front of their house, which you can see there. Uh, and so what happened was that Andrew, uh, who shared an office with George in another place, uh, they, they had to move, the, the owner was converting the office into apartments. And so Andrew needed an office and he proposed to his parents that he would build his office uh, and as a kind of turning, as an outbuilding. So it's a two-story building which has, which has plumbing and water and a bathroom. So you, you could use it as a guest house. He, his, right now he had his office on the top floor and the, the ground floor was used for storage. Uh, but it could have been turned into a, a two, uh, into a kind of small guest house or even a rental unit at the back of the garden. And you can see the beautiful walled garden on the left here. So it wasn't, as you'll see, complete, but we've got now about six or eight houses here. Uh, this is a view looking down. You can see Mary's house there, the, the sort of ochre colored house and the blue house. And, and Andrew's house in the back. There were actually still three more spaces left. Uh, there was a space for a house in the middle. There was the, the empty lot on the bottom right-hand corner, which Andrew's parents ended up buying. And so it became really a backyard for uh, Andrew's children to play in. Uh, he has three at this at the, by now. Uh, and there's another lot on the top right-hand corner, uh, which you can't see. But there are 20 people living on this third of an acre. That's a population density of 60 persons per acre. That's a very high density. Most, if you think of a lot of suburbs where you have one acre lots, you might have three or four persons per acre. So 60 persons per acre is a significant density uh, those long narrow spaces uh, tend to be tandem parking for, for cars. Uh, so this is a, a real urban density. Uh, 
and yet with many of the advantages of single family houses and you have cross ventilation, you have views in different directions, you have lots of light. Uh, what you tend not to have except for the Gould Cottage are gardens. The, the, uh, there's much less outdoor space and most of the outdoor space uh, as you see here is kind of overlaps with cars but in, in a kind of friendly way. There's not like living around an asphalt parking lot uh, you know, with white stripes everywhere. It's a, it's a, a space where, I, as I wrote in the book, where when one day we stop owning cars and we probably all end up using Uber, uh, this will just become a garden. Uh, unlike many parking lots where, which, which when emptied will just look like eyesores. At this point, Reed, Reed's life had changed. His, his long-term companion, uh, Sally, had joined him in, in Charleston. And he realized that the little Palladian house, which, which he didn't actually live in after a while because he couldn't afford it. He had to rent it out and he was living in, in, in a rented rooms nearby. Uh, it was going to be too small for him. He, Reed own, is a musician. He owns a grand piano. I mean, you couldn't even fit that into the Palladian house. So he and Sally decided they really need, wanted to buy a house, to, to build a house, a larger house. But when they worked it all out, it was, they, they realized they, can't really, they couldn't afford buying a large lot. It would have been a much larger house than most of the very small ones. So it wouldn't fit on any of the lots that were that Reed, that uh, Jerry still had. But, but what turned out was that Jerry, uh, I'm sorry, uh, that Reed looked around trying to find a land and, and lo and behold, it was the, there was a big piece of land right next to where, where he had built his little Palladian house. And this was, it was empty land that was rented out to a nursery and they used to store, uh, you know, bags of earth and sand and various things. Uh, and, and he got this idea that rather than, tr since he couldn't really afford to buy a big piece of land, he, he could, if he bought this land, he could build his house and, and also develop the land with other houses and sort of pay for him, his own house by, develop, by selling off lots for alternate other houses. So this is the house, this is his house, which was a, a house built around a raised courtyard. And I'll show you a picture later on. Uh, but his idea then was to surround it with maybe eight or 10 houses, which he would sell off the land and that other people would, would build and that would pay for his house. And because his house was big, he didn't want to sort of have, be the Lord of the manor. And so his house is wrapped in the other houses so that his house in fact is almost invisible. You don't actually see it. And it, it because it's, it's accessed in the back, it's, it's, it's a courtyard house. So it looks inward rather than outward. And there, there's only one place where you actually see the window. So this was the, the plan that he and George worked out for this. And their idea was to have many different architects working here, not, not to have a single architect design everything because that, that would be much too uniform and, it, and with a, it would either end up looking uniform or it would look like a piece of stage scenery and, and not real. So he, he wanted to have different architects and in the end, Andrew designed one, one or two of the houses, George designed some, uh, and several local architects that he worked with designed the other ones. Uh, Reed designed his own house himself. But here's a model of, of where you can see those three little arches are, which you'll see in a photograph later, are, are Reed's house with, with that courtyard way in the back. And then, there are these mostly three-story houses, very dense, very close together. Uh, Reed had seen uh, courtyards in Rome and he had this sort of idea of a Mediterranean little village almost with a street running down the center, which they called Catfiddle Street. 
so a very narrow lane running down the middle. Uh, again, all the, the parking is either on the surface or under the houses uh, or in a garage in one or two cases. So uh, the cars are fitted in rather than taking over. This is a photograph of a stage, the original stage set for Porgy and Bess uh, it, the, when it was produced on Broadway back in the, I guess, in the 40s. Uh, this is a photograph that Reed showed to the architects because this was, this is what he wanted. This was to give them a sense of, uh, he didn't, he, he, do, he wouldn't show the architects what the other architects were doing. So he didn't want them to sort of, copy each other or be constrained, but he did want them to give the feeling. So you could imagine a contemporary architect being shown this and trying to figure out what on earth to do, because it doesn't really look like architecture, but it has the sort of uh, atmosphere that, uh, that Reed hoped to, to achieve. Uh, and this is where we are in 2019. So this is about 14 years after uh, Jerry bought that uh, Friedman's cottage and started this whole thing rolling. Uh, you're looking down the street. That's not a garage. That's actually the, the road continues under the building and connects to the city street in the far. On the left, you connect the, to the, I, I should, th this all connects together. So the, the lane that runs through that, from Ashley Avenue on the left uh, meets a kind of T-junction with Catfiddle Street, and which is accessed both from Bogai Street at the bottom of the plan and, and connects to the Crosstown Expressway at the top of the plan. I should also mention that Reed organized everybody into a sort of, it's a kind of large condominium. So some of the neighbors joined in. So the house on the bottom left uh, was an old house, uh, became part of the condominium, uh, which enabled the owner to add two little houses, which you can see uh, in the back of her lot. Uh, so it became, in, in a sense, a, a, a it's like a condominium uh, of about 20 odd houses on about one acre of land. So, so again, keep even probably slightly more dense than the initial uh, slide I showed. To give you a sense of, I don't know, there's no way we can get rid of these pictures, is there? Because they, they, they're intrusive and you can't see all of the slide. People can actually like uh, pick it up and move it. In fact, you can move the picture around the screen so it's on the way. Yeah, I don't have a cursor. Here, yeah. so can't do it. <laughs> well, we anyway, can... on the, the house, the red house on the right, uh, which actually feels more like a New Orleans house than a Charleston house, although Charleston has a lot of beautiful old uh, wrought iron work. Uh, there's a, an, an entry on the right hand side, which is actually the entrance to get to Reed's house in the back, which I'll show you. Uh, this is looking under the house. This is a, a, a little public alley that gets you into the rear. Uh, that piece of wrought iron at the top was something that Reed found years ago and sort of had in storage. He didn't know what he was going to do with it, but it became kind of the, the design motif that that influenced the, the entrance and this, uh, the, on the left-hand side, as you walk down, there's the entrance to the ground floor apartment of that red building. And then if you keep going on the right-hand side is our, is garbage containers and electrical boxes and things like that. And then when you get to the back, there's a stair that takes you up uh, to the second level and gives you access both to the red house and to the house on the left hand side of the slide and further on uh, to Reed's house. And there's the, what, the entrance to the red house uh, whose main unit is on the second floor and, and the floor above. And then 
for if you keep going on the right is the the door the front door of the house the next house on the right and then the far you can see the the sort of gate that leads into the courtyard of Reed's house which actually feels kind of chinese to me uh, with this this tiled roof and and especially courtyards are very common in traditional chinese architecture and so this has a a lot of that feeling. You can see that he, Reed made, took a lot of care. The, the courtyard, the street is actually paved with old bricks. I can't remember where they came from, some Midwestern town. Uh, they look like normal bricks and they weigh about three times as much as a normal brick. So these were bricks that were made in the beginning of the 20th century, specifically for paving streets. Uh, and again, they give a, a beautiful texture and, and a sense of character. And then when you look in, uh, there's the courtyard and Reed's, the entrance, the sort of loggia of Reed's house, uh, and then the house in the background. I, I wanted to read you one thing. Uh, I, I started by talking about the uh, subtitle to the book. Uh, the, the title, Charleston Fancy, uh, what does that mean? Fancy, according to the dictionary, has three meanings. Uh, the first meaning is a feeling of liking or attraction. Well, that's simple because all the characters in my story were attracted to Charleston and attracted to Charleston architecture. And I started the book with a quote from G.K. Chesterton. And it's a wonderful quote. He said, men did not love Rome uh, because she was great. She was great because men had loved her. And I, I talk about how Charleston reflects that sort of uh, sentiment. Uh, it was one of the first cities, towns, cities in the United States uh, with a specific law, to, uh, the first city, in fact, in the United States to have a preservation law, a zoning preservation law, which said this zone is special. You can't just tear down buildings. You can't build whatever you want. You have to go before a special architectural board, which will review whatever, what you're doing, whether you're changing the shutters on your house or building a new house, you have to do that. Uh, this was done in 1930, just when zoning had become possible. The, the Supreme Court had ruled that zoning was, was, a legal, was legal, and Charleston decided to use zoning, but for different ends, for preservation ends. The second meaning of fancy is the faculty of imagination. And again, that's obvious when even you, I didn't show you, you know, the Gothic castle that one of the characters built for himself or the Orthodox Byzantine church that Andrew and George designed uh, or the Byzantine house that George built for himself, which has domes and uh, arcades and it, it's, was an extraordinary thing. So imagination is really what fuels the architecture and what fuels uh, what I've been showing you. Uh, it's also a good reminder that cities don't grow by replicating themselves. They, they partially replicate, but they also add things. Uh, there, I, I, when I was walking around Charles, I found from the sort of early 1900s, a Moorish building. So somebody was building in Charleston. It was a bank, or I think, originally. And they, they said, well, I'm sick of all this colonial architecture. Let's try something else. I, there's no logic to building a Moorish building in a, uh, in a colonial town. But that's what makes Charleston interesting. Uh, I'm, I would never say that you can just build anything anywhere. And I, I tell a number of stories of, of, sort of big debates in Charleston about, for instance, modern buildings. Modern buildings often don't make very good neighbors. Um, but 
a Moorish building might make a good neighbor. Or I've shown you a number of buildings, I mean, a Palladium buildings. Uh, the Georgian style was the original style of Charleston because Georgian was what people built in Britain and it was all English people who settled uh, Charleston. And so naturally they built Georgian buildings, but uh, they didn't, their Palladio is not, is, was an Italian from the Renaissance. Uh, that Jacobean building I showed you, the, the red building, Mary's house is a very different sort of building. But it's the third definition, dictionary definition of fancy, which caught my fancy. And it has to do, it's a term from 16th and 17th century music. A fancy is a composition for keyboard or strings in free or variation form. And I think that's what this book in a way is about. It's about freedom and variation and improvisation and unexpected things happening and accidents turned into beauty of a sort. And all of this coming together, uh, partly for real estate reasons, these many of these buildings that uh, Jerry, for instance, built the Blue House, the Freedman's Cottage, he eventually sold and there are now owners living in there. Um, so it's this mixture of architectural fancy, of real estate economics and realities, and of a very particular place and how the three come together and interact. Thank you. I, I intentionally tried to keep this from getting too long, so we have plenty of time for questions, which I'll be happy to try and answer. Thank you, Vitold, and uh, I encourage you, if you have questions, we have the Q&A little icon or symbol should be at the bottom of your screen. I encourage you to um, type your, your questions in. Um, got little applause lines going on the chat, so that's wonderful. Um, one of the early questions that came in uh, was wondering, what, what, what made you more interested in, in Charleston architecture instead of um, the architecture of another, uh, quote, charm city like Savannah or New Orleans. I wasn't interested in Charleston as Charleston. I, it was really the people. I, I had met George. Uh, actually, the first person I met was Vince Graham, who I haven't talked about, but who plays a big role in the book, who's a developer. And I, uh, I met him probably 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, I, and I met George, I was giving a lecture in Charleston and, and uh, Vince introduced me to, to, uh, to George and George said, oh, I, I was lecturing about Palladio as it happened. And George said, oh, I built a Palladian house. And I thought, oh geez, it'll be another one of these horrible travesties that people call Palladian houses and then they get everything wrong. But, but he was, he sounded like an interesting person. And so I went along with him and he, he, he had built a Palladian bungalow for his sister, which was a beautiful house. I mean, really ex exceptionally beautiful. And one of the very few modern Palladio houses that, that has the feeling of Palladio. The Palladian houses are very rough. Uh, they're really farmhouses with a kind of classical veneer, but, but they're, rusticness makes them charming as much as the as the roman columns and and he had gotten that feeling into the house and so uh, we became friends and i used, whenever i was in charleston i would look him up and see what he was doing and i should say that the genesis of this book was uh vince emailed me and said we, this so, terrible thing has happened. George's house has burnt down. This beautiful Byzantine house with the, the domes and the, the columns and everything. And I, I, so the next time I, I blush to say that I had been thinking about writing about George and his friends and I couldn't figure out how to start a book about them. They, they were, oh, there were many projects, but they didn't sort of add up to anything. And then I suddenly realized his house burned down. I could start with that. A fire is, is, 
It's not as good as a murder like the Savannah book, but it's almost as good as a murder. And I thought that gives me some dramatic beginning and, and I'm not sure where the book will go after this, but, but it'll, it's a way of entering the story. And, and so that was the, the first line of the book is that George's house burnt down two weeks before Christmas or something like that. And so I didn't pick Charleston in the, in the sense of, you know, should it be Charleston or Savannah or New Orleans? It was really this connection with people that, that I, it had been floating around in my mind that their story was interesting. Uh, but I, I, I wasn't sure how, to, how I could tell it. Uh, and it was really, as I said, the book is about three things. And so that was much too complicated to figure out ahead of time. And I really only understood that at the end when I finished the book. Thank you. We have several questions related to Charleston zoning ordinances. I'll sum up in one of them. Wanted to know, um, the Charleston zoning ordinances already allow for such a delightful, intimate and dense housing arrangement or were there variances granted for this gradual development? The historic zoning really was based on the notion that uh, it started with just a very small part of the peninsula, right at the very bottom. And then over the 70 years since, since then, it grew. So it, it now includes the entire peninsula. So it's a very large area. Uh, and basically they said, anybody who wants to build a house or demolish a house. People had been demolishing houses, especially New York antiques dealers, and sending you know, the paneling back up to New York to sell in antique stores. And, and they were you know, recovering beautiful old fireplaces and ceilings and plaster casts. Uh, and of course, this was very upsetting to Charlestonians. And so this is partly a reaction to that. Uh, it was, it's interesting because it was not done at a period when Charleston was very rich, quite the opposite. It was a very poor city. It had suffered after the Civil War. And it was, it had, what had once been the fourth largest city in the colonies was really a, a complete backwater. Uh, but they, people loved their city. It, it, that Chesterton quote, men did not love Rome because it was great. It was great because they had loved her. And Charlestonians loved Charleston. And so the, this zoning, preservation zoning code required that people present their plans to a board, it was called the architect, Board of Architectural Review. And it was appointed by the city. There was an architect, an engineer, a real estate person, uh, and a couple of other people. Um, this, was a, this was not a discretionary board this board was yes or no and if the board said no you just that you couldn't build you couldn't demolish you you had to come back with another plan and they were very strict so this was not one of those review boards which which as philadelphia has which which has no power this was a very powerful board and and the reason that charleston is beautiful today is really because of that that there Charleston's, other than, you know, Washington, D.C., Charleston's one of the few cities that has no high-rise buildings downtown. There are no towers all over the place. There are some slightly taller buildings from the 50s that snuck through. Uh, I mean, there, there's always a way to get around rules if you're a developer. So there were, but there's, there is no high-rise downtown. It, it, it's a city of basically four, roughly four stories. And with, with, and you still have the church steeples sticking up here and there. Um, what happens later, the question was asking about the density. The density is, is not necessarily part of the zoning code. The density is uh, allowed by the city because it wants the city to densify. It's on a peninsula, it has nowhere to go. It can't, it can't go sideways into the water. And so uh, it, it encourages densification uh, and the the mayor of Charleston is very famous among architects and urbanists uh, because he uh, he's been mayor for I think thirty or forty years, Joe Riley, uh, and not an architect but somebody with real architectural sensibilities and and his administration I think was very 
active in, in promoting densification. But once you have densification, you still have to go through the Board of Architectural Review. The one thing the Board of Architectural Review allows is that if, if you can't see the building from the street, you're, you don't have, they're, they're not going to be very strict about the way it looks. So for example, uh, Reed's house, which is virtually invisible from anywhere, uh, was not reviewed very intensely by the board because since you couldn't actually see it from the street, they weren't really concerned with it. And that was true of most houses. So the, the houses in the backs of lots, unless they're visible, uh, tend to get less uh, strict review than a house which is facing the street, which, which, which is then reviewed and it, it has to meet uh, aesthetic standards. It, like all review boards, there are no rules. So the architects go up there hoping with their fingers crossed and, and there's a certain amount of sort of idiosyncratic personal judgment involved. Uh, I'm not sure there's much other ways you can do it. Uh, but the densification has been very important uh, in terms of allowing less expensive units uh, like these small rental one bedroom units, uh, you know, for people like students or uh, I tell the whole story of the a development that started in the 80s uh, by George and and Jerry and, and a th their third partner uh, where they were building houses which they were renting to, you know, waiters and barmen and people working in ver downtown restaurants. Uh, and they were starting at a time when um, in in very rough neighborhoods. I mean, Charleston in the 80s was not the Charleston we see today, which is full of tourists and very pretty. It, it was like many uh, cities in the 70s and 80s around the country. It had really been abandoned. There were a lot of empty houses. Uh, people were not taking care of houses. and and there were drugs and crime and all sorts of things. And that's all, that was all part of the story that I tell of how George and, uh, George and Jerry sort of began. So by the time the project that I showed you, they were experienced and the city was already a much more civilized sort of place. There, there was much more tourism. There were many more hotels built. There was much more local employment. And it, it was a very different sort of place. So there's a question if the ideas that were used to construct these, this group of houses could be used in Philadelphia. Sorry, say that again, the, what? Could, could, the, could the ideas used to construct this uh -huh. group of houses be used in Philadelphia in, uh, in, in building? I think the idea of, I mean, Philadelphia is a much bigger city, of course, than, uh, than Charleston. And so, and, and the downtown, sadly in some ways has really become much more of a generic high-rise American downtown. Uh, so it, I, it would, it, it's, it's apples and oranges in a certain way. I think Philadelphia passed the point where it, it lost control at some point. Um, I, I despise all the glass boxes that are going up. Uh, architects who used to work in stone and brick, and, and you can get quite sentimental about some of the, uh, the housing from the 60s, which is brick. Uh, today, everything's glass. It has to be glass. Everything's floor to ceiling glass. And it really destroys the character of the city, in my opinion, because Philadelphia is so much a brick and masonry city that the glass becomes an intrusion. Uh, so in that sense, it, it's, the train has left the station, I'm afraid. Uh, probably in surrounding places it would be a more, it would be easier to imagine some of these ideas taking hold in, uh, you know, in some of the towns around Philadelphia, that, uh, smaller scale places. Um, it's probably easier to imagine. Uh, there was a moment, I think, in the 60s where downtown Philadelphia was building a lot of you know, two or three story uh, houses. Uh, 
especially on the secondary streets along the lanes. Um, today, that, that seems to be m more rare, partly as the cost of housing and price of housing went up, and partly uh, the cost of land has gone up and, and people are more interested in, in taller buildings with apartments rather than houses. Uh, so, so it would be the the main. I one of the the lessons I drew from the uh, Charleston is going through a tough period now, and the tough period is because it's so successful. Uh, suddenly, national builders and developers are looking at Charleston. They would never have gone there in the in the fifties and sixties and seventies. There was no market. There was no demand. Uh, you couldn't charge enough to to justify building new buildings, but now you it's it's become a hot market, and and that's a real challenge for a city because uh, the architects who are doing the work are not local. They the national builders have their own architects, and you're getting large scale buildings, not necessarily tall buildings, because the city is still controlling that but buildings that take up a city block. And unless you're a very good architect, they're, they're not easy to design. And uh, there are some good examples, but there are also some pretty bad examples. So uh, success can be a bigger challenge than, than you know, lack of success, economic success for a city. Uh, most of the really innovative ideas that came to Charleston when it became the first American city to introduce historic zoning were done when Charleston was a very poor backward place with without really a lot of pressure. The only pressure was people wanted to tear down buildings and, and take away the nice parts and sell them in their antique stores. But uh, there was no pressure to build things. And yet that was the time when people kind of got together and said, we want to save the city and we want it to, to keep its character and we don't want we don't want the character to change. Uh, so it, it, it's harder to do that when there's an awful lot of money floating around. And, uh, and when, the, uh, when you're looking at uh, big companies doing big projects, which tend to, the sort of thing I've been showing you adds up to lots of houses, but it takes a lot, lot more time and the whole scale of the operation is very different. It, it, it this all makes economic sense. I mean, none of the people in my story are independently wealthy. This is not sort of a hobby of wealthy people who are just doing fancy architecture because it interests them. These projects made economic sense. They, they made money for the people developing them but they were done at a scale and sort of a time scale and a and a scale of operations that's very small and that's that's hard to imagine especially these days in Philadelphia things things are moving too quickly we it's it's hard for a small operation to to be successful well looking at our time i'm going to just pick a couple two more questions for you one um is a very pertinent one. How do you feel that Charleston architecture will be shaped as climate change and flooding become more of an issue? Flooding is a big problem. It, uh, before everybody listening decides to move to Charleston, you, you have to know they have terrible hurricanes and it's, a, it's called the low country because it's low and it floods. Uh, the project I showed you, Catfiddle Street, what was built when the city had had a requirement that any project with more than I think five or six dwelling units had to capture all groundwater. In other words, you had to build a huge concrete water tank under underground uh, so that when you got flooding, you would capture that water and then you would release it slowly into the sewage system, you know, over time. And, and if, if, if everybody, if all new buildings do that, eventually you're able to control things like flooding. Uh, it, Catfiddle Street was not in a low part of town. I mean, there were other parts of town which were much more susceptible, but that cost read a million dollars. 
there's a huge extra cost for the developer to bear. Uh, it's basically the whole under the street is a huge concrete water tank. Um, so I, the new projects are, are the city is, is facing it that way. Uh, this is not necessarily global warming. It's, it's simply the flooding that was, that was always a feature of Charleston but which at one point they, they had to face up to. So that's, they are, do, they are taking steps that way. Um, Charleston had a very hard history. I, I, there's a chapter that deals with the background. I mean, it, it, was, it, it was bombed during the War of Independence. It was burnt during the Civil War. A uh, large part of it was burnt. Uh, it had an earthquake only once in history, but a really serious one. A lot of the, those beautiful steeples fell down. Uh, and then it has regular hurricanes. The, the last big hurricane uh, that hit the city uh, caused a lot of damage, both flooding as well as uh, wind damage. And then of course it, it's, it has flooding simply because every time there is a hurricane, even if it doesn't hit Charleston, uh, there are uh, wa the water the rivers rise and then uh, you have flooding problems. Uh, so <clears throat> it's not ideal and it's going to cost a lot of money. Uh, and I suspect there will be more stringent uh, requirements in the future. Uh, as, uh, that again, that will, that will attack the problem, but will also tend to discourage the sort of very small development. I mean, if you, if you notice the dates, it took Reed about six years. It took him three years just to get through all the permissions process. And he's only building eight houses, or at least developing eight houses, so eight or ten. So it, it tends to favor the bigger developers, because a bigger developer can, you know, if you're building 200 houses, you can amortize the extra cost of doing flood prevention measures much more easily than somebody just building six houses. Well, I think the perfect final question has just come in um, and I'll allow you to toot your horn a little bit. Uh, are you working on a new book? I am. Um, partly, I guess, uh, it's one of the things that we were talking about this earlier. One of the things that has kept me busy during the pandemic is that uh, writers are, are work at home anyway. So it, it hasn't caused a huge change in my lifestyle from that, at least not in that one way. Uh, I'm, I've been writing a book that tries to bring together my interest in history in a very ambitious way because it's called the story of architecture and it's, it's really a influence by uh, e. E. F. E. H. Gombrich's book, The Story of Art. And he, he, he's written a book, he wrote this book in the 50s and it's still in print, it's a wonderful book. And he, he wanted to write a book that told the story of art for people who knew nothing about art. Uh, he's a great uh, reputable art historian, he was a great reputable art historian, but he, he said he wanted a, a sort of a teenager who knew nothing about art to be, to, to be his reader. Uh, and so I, I, thought, I thought it was a wonderful idea and I'm trying to, to write a, the story of architecture which, which, will be, which will be readable, not a reference book that you would look up every single building that was ever built, but rather a book that uh, explains the story because it, it, architecture is a story. It's a, it changes. What, why does it change? Why do we have these different styles? You know, why do, why, why do we have Gothic and then Gothic suddenly stops and then, and yet Yale University just built two Gothic colleges last year. I mean, there's a, the, why does it, why does architecture get revived regularly, uh, which doesn't necessarily happen in other fields. And uh, also why do, why do we care so much about buildings? And one reason is that buildings last such a long time. I mean, the, the, the Athenaeum was built, what, in 18, I can't remember the date, I should know the date by heart, uh, and it's still used. So 
uh, architects sometimes get frustrated. They talk about modern architecture. And, but the fact is we all, especially if we're in a city like Charleston or Boston we're, or Philadelphia, we all live, work, uh, play in old places. Uh, just as much as in new places where uh, the Athenaeum is an old building, but it's a place where people go today. It's just part of people's lives. It's not, it's not an antique. It's, it's the place where they go and, and hear talks and get books and so on. So architecture is very unusual in that, in that regard. And I think uh, old buildings accompany people throughout their entire lives and, and, Sometimes old buildings are more real to people than the building that was built last year. Uh, so uh, it's an, an unusual uh, craft or art or activity that brings together practical things and, and aesthetic things in a, again, in a kind of unique way. I mean, paintings don't have to do a job, whereas buildings have a job to do as well as uh, looking interesting or attractive or or uh, being objects of beauty as well as utility. So that's, uh, that's the story that I'm working on telling. Thank you. I know we're looking forward to, uh, to reading that book when it comes out and um, having it considered again for our literary award. As you all will see on our screen rotating through, if you try to check out the book from the Athenaeum and it's already checked out and you don't wanna wait, you can buy it through bookshop.org uh, backslash shop backslash Villa Athenaeum. A portion of the proceeds will come to the Athenaeum to support our work. We invite you also to check out and register for some of our, our upcoming programs. You can find those at villaathenaeum.org uh, backslash events.html. And if you love what you find here at the Athenaeum, we invite you to become a member and become a regular part of our community. Tonight, we are so thrilled yet again to have shared this time with Vitold Rubczynski. Um, we congratulate him on winning the Literary Award for the third time and uh, look forward to celebrating in person with you when we are able to. But tonight, I invite you all to virtually, you know, send up your, your uh, applause and uh, gratitude to Vitold for the time he's given to us. Thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Mm -hmm.